a record-breaking event underway in California. May not look like it on the satellite, but check out these winds. These are modeled forecasting winds from 4 a.m. until 7 p.m. today. This covers the central Sierra Nevada. There's Yosemite Park, and they're forecasting a max of 49 miles an hour. And in the higher elevations, 85 in some areas. And further south, this is towards the Bakersfield Mojave area. There's some of the gusts they're expecting, 53 at Bakersfield, and possibly up to 72 at Mojave. Now, last night they did get some strong winds just south of Yosemite. This is at Cascadell Heights in the Sierra Nevadas. And check out what happened last night. This graph here shows the passage of the upper level disturbance. And the first thing you see is right there at about 9.50 p.m. The dew points drop from about 35 down to 15. And the winds pick up from about 5 miles an hour up to about 95 to 100 miles an hour. And then the station went offline at 11.02 p.m. And this is about where that station was in relation to Fresno. That's going to be right around, yeah, right around in here. So that's only at about 5,000 feet or so. That's not back in the actual Sierra Nevadas. That's more or less on the foothills. And Yosemite Park located up in this region here. Now what happened is there was a large region of cold air advection, and that produced a phone wind, F-O-E-H-N, which crossed over the mountains and sifted through these valleys, and in some areas there was local strengthening of those winds. Now just to show you how all that set up, this is the GFS run from yesterday. We had a bunch of cold air setting up right there in the high deserts of Nevada. As the day went on, a lot of it accumulated here on the windward side of the Sierra Nevadas, and you can see that pressure differential really setting in there. And you can watch some of those wind plots right there. This is a, about when that station got that high wind, and you can see the plots here only showing about 25 to 30 knots. GFS is not really good at picking up localized effects, but this is nevertheless very significant, very strong indication there of channeling of the winds through the mountain passes there. And that brings us up to the current time right about there. So the winds are still blowing through those mountainous regions, but they're actually moving into the Mojave Desert. You can see 30 knots indicated there. And eventually that's going to reach the mountains of Los Angeles and San Diego today and this afternoon. And there's the information card from Los Angeles showing the impacts in that region. Now, for those of you not familiar with the geography, there's the Sierra Nevadas in Eastern California. There's Fresno, and we're going to pan south because that's where the action is going. There's Bakersfield. That's going to be in the south part of the San Joaquin Valley. Then we have the mountains north of Los Angeles located right there. There's L.A., and just north of there, we have Mojave. That's going to be right there near Tehachapi Pass. There's Lancaster. There's Barstow. And I think that's probably most of the important ones at this time. And Ron Chalfant, he's probably going to be adding his comments. He's located in this area in the mountains, so he's probably getting some of that wind. And there's what it looks like at Bakersfield. They apparently had the frontal passage right about here. That was about one to two hours ago, the winds turned around to the east and they're blowing at 25 knots. But at Mojave, they have been raging since at least midnight last night. And you can see those northeast winds there. They're still increasing and we're seeing 28 gusting to 43 knots right now. Now, the model that's most likely to pick up on these winds is going to be the high-resolution rapid refresh. We don't have the panels for last night, but this is how it looked at about 2 in the morning in California. The shading is proportional to the wind speed, and you can see it concentrated right there around Yosemite. And then running that forward, you can see how the winds spread all the way down towards the Los Angeles area. That's what we're seeing right now. 
And there's the current chart, and we're looking at that peaking in about a few hours. So that'll be right around the time that this video is posted. And this is the last frame I wanted to show you. This is the 500 millibar heights and vorticity for last night. And there we see the strong jet streak. It's in between the red and the gray coloring right in here. Highest winds right around here. And you can see that spreading southward into the Sierra Nevadas as the evening goes on. Looks very packed right, at, right there in the Sierra Nevadas. And then it slips south towards the Santa Barbara Vandenberg area this morning. And gradually, most of that energy is moving offshore, but the easterly winds, I mean, we have not cleared out that cold air, so it's still trying to punch out over the mountain passes. And finally, that brings us to our United States analysis. And what we see here is a very strong pressure differential between northern Nevada and coastal California. 20 millibars between Winnemucca and the San Francisco Monterey area. Similar pressure differential between LA and Elko and Winnemucca. And those are some of the rules of thumb that the offices use there to anticipate high winds. Elsewhere around the country, we are covered by this very large high. Another portion of it moving into New Mexico and Texas. New Mexico likewise getting some wind impacts there. You can see Albuquerque there, 35 knots out of the east, coming through that mountain pass right there on Interstate 40. And that's a very similar setup to what we have in California. Not so much driven by the jet stream energy. However, the low level pressure differential, the cold air advection, that's enough to bring the winds up in that part of the country. And winds are also gusting down there in Texas. And we also have overcast due to isentropic lift with the 850 millibar winds coming out of the southeast. That's given us an overrunning pattern and producing clouds and precip. And the rain is coming down outside as I record this right now. Elsewhere around the country, yeah, there's weather there too. The Great Lakes getting this little Alberta clipper. Behind it, a little bit colder, single digits in the Duluth area. The warm wedge located about right here, that's the warm sector. Not much warm air in that. Temperatures just slightly above freezing in Detroit, Erie, Pittsburgh. And that's just enough to squeak out a little warm sector through that region and differentiate that air from the cold front to the north and the warm front to the northeast. Then further north in Canada, it's hard to believe that it's actually warmer in the Northwest Territories than in some parts of Vermont. 23 degrees right there. And as you go south towards Dawson Creek, British Columbia, the start of the Alaska Highway, it's 41 degrees there. Some of that downslope air coming across the Canadian Rockies and warming on the lee side. Much of this air here is of Pacific origin. So it's been warmed by the ocean currents. It's rather temperate and it crosses the mountains and modifies a bit and we end up with these mild temperatures. 40 degrees there around White Court, Alberta. Not too much going on in the Canadian Arctic. I don't really see much Arctic air. There's a little bitterly cold there, air in Banks Island to Victoria Island, and they do have blizzard warnings for Saks Harbor down towards the southwestern Victoria Island coast. All in all, this is very typical of the Canadian Arctic, so we're not seeing any big changes up there that would affect the U.S. at this time. And why not take a look at Siberia? Yep, our first minus 70 reading. Actually, there's a couple of them. There's one here and one there. And let me get those stations for you. Well, the western station is going to be Cabiardino. I've never heard of that one. And this other one. Yeah, that's another weird one. Bestiaskaya Zvera Firma. So that's not going to be the typical ones that get cold, like Verkoyansk and Yakutsk, but 
Those stations there are also quite cold, and we've got that minus 67 just up the Lena River. And we'll take a very quick look at Europe. We do have a couple of viewers there. Now, one thing that is going on is this uh, developing Bear Clinic system. You'll notice that this is a discrete cold front, discrete warm front. This is not a big occluded system in its decaying phase. This is going to be quite potent for the UK. And uh, just to show you the basic features, there's the warm sector. Doesn't look very warm, but for Europe, that's certainly warm, almost up near 50 degrees. And you can see the high dew points up in the 40s. Now, let's switch to the GFS. So just to give you the basic features, there's England right there. We have Scotland up here, and there's Ireland. So if I draw the fronts on, watch this little system come together. First, what you're going to notice is this wave move to the north. Okay, so as we get into tonight and tomorrow, that moves up into the North Sea. And then you're going to see this new system come together in southern Ireland. Now, here's the cold front that's going to be following right in behind and check out what happens as it moves eastward through the UK. So this is the frame here for Wednesday evening. Very strong cold front for that part of the, the world. Moving eastward and some thunderstorms developing along that around Bristol, out towards Swindon, and they move rapidly eastward. You can see the tight pressure gradient. That crosses right over London. So there's the possibility overnight, Wednesday night, for some very strong gusts through that area maybe some damage with that, and some thunderstorms in northern France as that moves eastward. So if I was there in Europe, I'd be kind of impressed by that. And that ends up moving eastward into the Netherlands and Germany during the morning on Thursday. And there it goes. And now we're getting into that occlusion stage. I don't know how deep that is, probably about 950. But it looks to me like the cold front has surged east, the warm front lifted north, and then we've got the occlusion up to the north like that. And you can see on the backside that wrap around that cold conveyor belt really gets going, and you can see snows there developing in Scotland. That's going to be Thursday morning. And then as that passes, we have a couple of strong waves down to the south with the southern stream. That heads more towards southern France, and it appears that there are some pretty good showers there in northern Italy, Switzerland, and Austria. So that's going to be for the weekend. So here in North America, we're going to be in this progressive pattern. Looks like there's a threat of a block developing downstream around Greenland, but things seem to be progressive with a numerous series of waves coming inland. And there's a strong tendency for these waves in the Pacific to shear off along the west coast. And you can see that take place here as we run this forward. There comes a wave through Alaska. That's going to be right there. And as that slips south, you can see a wave, a cutoff flow developing there. Next trough comes down the west coast around the 25th. And that tries to close off. The next one off the Oregon coast does close off. And I don't really see much blocking going on. So we're going to have the jet stream in place, cut off lows in the southwestern U.S., and that appears to be the rule all the way through the end of the month. And then this is getting way out there as far as the GFS goes, but it carves off this very strong trough. And I noticed on the surface panels, it was starting to develop some Arctic air up in Yukon and Northwest Territories. I can't say for sure if that's going to move south, but that would be something to watch for later. We're going to have at least another week to monitor that. And just to show you the progression of the air masses, there's the 850 millibar temperature anomaly. You can see that it is warm in Canada and central U.S. Not much change, really. Most of the cold air remains locked up there in Canada. And then we start getting to the end of the range of accuracy as far as the GFS goes. So maybe we can add some crystal ball music kind of as a reminder that we're getting 
into sketchy territory. But this is the Arctic air starting to develop. You're going to see that come together there in Alaska and Yukon at the very end. Yeah, there it, go, there it gets going. And some of it goes offshore and helps carve out that trough that we were looking at. And after that, it remains to be seen whether that comes south. It looks like it does there towards the end, but there's also the question of whether there is going to be Arctic air up to the north. So the first indicators of that really don't pop up until around the 29th. That's 240 hours out. So we're going to have to wait on that one. And that's all for this installment of Forecast Lab. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care and have a great rest of your Tuesday. Bye-bye.